I became pastor of UBC is one of the largest, smallest churches in town, less than a hundred in Sunday school. And when I left, it was the largest church in town. Uh -huh. I, and I've never started saying that till the last year, but I realized that I'm glad not to brag about it. You know what I mean? And and uh, not only that, two of the other largest churches in Arkansas came out of my church. Mm -hmm. Fellowship here and Fellowship in Little Rock. That's interesting, isn't it? And there's several others, you know. I told Karen, and I said, you're one of the best marketers I know because I remember, you know, I, we grew up in Arkansas idolizing the Razorbacks. Yeah. And you were smart enough to realize that. And that so you started getting the uh, the athletes as ushers and as you know, collecting the, 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 the plates. So we get to go to church and see Cliff Powell and Bill Burnett and you know yeah. just one athlete after another. And led them both to Christ. Uh -huh. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well, Cliff had a great testimony. He said, people have told me to read the Bible, they've told me to come to church, they've told me to clean up my life, but no one ever told me I needed to accept Jesus Christ. Isn't that a good line? Uh -huh. And I led Bill and his little wife Linda both to Christ and married him. Yeah, I remember when I took him down, he was a leading scorer, went out for barbecue. And he said, man, I've done all this, but, you know, I, there's something missing. <laughs> Isn't that great? And then, too, the other key thing, though, Jim, was the fraternity sorority. See, most Christians held them off, you know. Mm -hmm. Glenn Clayton was a great professor of physics. He was He's the man that saved me. I'd have never made it without him. He's the greatest layman I ever had. I call him Super Deacon. <laughs> but he was on the executive board, and he was down at Little Rock one time with all the Baptists, and he they were, he heard them talking about the church. Oh, a good night, that University Baptist liberal as a hoot out. He said, man, they'll be out drinking and partying on Saturday night, then be in church Sunday morning. <laughs> mm -hmm. See, what should have been a miracle, they're condemning because they're unworthy to come. Isn't that interesting? And and then half of them would become Christians. I didn't realize the watch care program was controversial. And Gwen told me about that. That, uh, But I thought that was f fabulous. I grew up Episcopalian, but it was a way to get into the church. What a great entry program for Isn't the that church. So? Yeah. yeah, see, but that hit me the one night I was having the Lord's Supper. And we had one little Methodist girl, Beauty, I think she was a coyote, uh, who just accepted Christ. Man, she was just radiant, witnessing to everybody in her house. And, uh, but she hadn't been baptized yet. Mm -hmm. And then we had this old cold Baptist deacon who knew the truth, he was there every Sunday, but you know, uh, you talk about having the gift of discouragement, he had it. And uh, you know, he judged everything. And we were getting ready to have a large supper. And they had said something about some of these kids are not even Baptist type of love. And I thought to myself, there are these two people, this old dead fundamentalistic, you know, dry Baptist deacon versus this young, excited young Methodist girl who's overflowing with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he can take the supper, but she can't. I'm not gonna, we were also, one of, if not the first, uh, white Baptist church had black members. Okay. I took some heat on that. See, no one realizes all those battles. I got them with this, though. I said, I quoted my old professor down there, Jack McGorman, boy, he was great with this one, New Testament and Greek. He said, when it came to race, he said, how can I refuse to call someone my brother whom God has called his son. <laughs> As I look back on it, it's really been a great run. I've, I've served the Lord in my generation. I can't believe it's all over. I still don't feel like it. Remember I told you what my old Air Force, my best Air Force buddy, he was Episcopalian. And he was through, we had dinner together. He was a colonel. <clears throat> he said, H, how old do you say you really feel if you didn't really know how old you really were? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Isn't that a good line? Yeah. See, I still feel 58. Uh -huh. 60, I can't walk like I can. You know, I can't.
do it, the energy level. But I'm still just as. Very much. Is obviously very, very sharp. Well, I hope so. I, uh, young man, he's written uh, two or three books now. What really makes you feel stupid is your kids grow up and write books and you're still <laughs> doodling on the board, you know. Yeah. Hadn't done anything. He wants to come and interview me for another book. Good. He, he wrote one book. It's, uh, uh, let me see, Forever. What was the title of it? I Take uh, Until Death Do Us Part. Mm -hmm. He's interviewed about 20 couples and talked about their end experience with their mate died of cancer or something like that oh. and how they handled it at the end. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. And he's doing another one, I don't know what, but he wants to interview me, he said, about, uh, you know, wisdom. But, uh, it takes a pretty adroit young person to appreciate age. I've always appreciated age. If they have anything to say, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and and it becomes more real. See, death right now, I'm seeing death in a different light that I've never seen it before. You would at 84. You know, you don't think there's that much difference. And I don't know, I could have another 10 years, I doubt it, but I'm down to my last two or three. And that really kind of excites me, but well, I sure don't want to blow it. Mm -hmm. And keeping this running with the personal people that still talking to me. That's, I told Kathy, here I am, 84, and I still hadn't written a book yet. I've just squandered my life. And she said, well, yeah, but a lot of those people who've written the book, they haven't had the personal ministry you have with people. See, Robert said that, uh, Cup, well, Robert Cup and Robert Lewis, both of them, and Dennis Rainey, who uh, you know. Raising a modern day night. And, uh, okay. Now, those are three of my dearest, closest young disciples. Mm -hmm. And they all didn't even know Christ when I met them. Then you don't want anything from them. You just thank God you had something to give. Mm -hmm. And if they, and they took, they took yeah, it and ran it. If they appreciate it, wonderful. Because someone gave something to me. Mm -hmm. I'm what I am, but you know, and you, you you're too much in the battle. It's like uh, being in the midst of the battle, and suddenly you find somebody who really understands as they're with you and you heat you up a little coffee and get ready to eat your roll and have some fellowship together, and then the, the next shell comes on. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you're, and you're out of the foxhole again or running to the next one, see? Yeah. See, a lot of those great lessons, but I just give myself more to Christ every day. You know, Lord Jesus, do something.